Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. In today's episode, I speak with Charlie Reed, Managing Director of Blue Loop, the world's leading online resource for professionals working in the visitor attraction sector. We discuss what attractions can learn from the COVID-19 situation and the positives that are to come from it. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. It's really lovely to have you. You too. Thanks for inviting me along. Very welcome. So I I always start off these interviews by asking you a few icebreaker questions just to get to know the real you. And we haven't spoken before, so this will be a quite nice um, insight into what the real Charlie is like. I hope you're I hope you're prepared. Uh, <laughs> okay, so can you tell me what's top of your bucket list? Oh, top of my bucket list. Um I think my main passion in life is, is probably wildlife. So I've never been on a safari to East Africa Africa. So that's something I'd like to do. Oh, that would be pretty incredible. Obviously the, the wildebeest and the crocodiles and the lions and so on. Lovely. Good bucket list. Okay, and um, can you tell me what's the worst job you've ever had? Oh my, I, I had a job once um, where I had to ring up people from a very, very long list and ask if they wanted to um, speak to someone to sell pensions to them. So I wasn't the guy selling the pensions, I was the guy trying to make appointments and the percentage of people who told me to get lost was very high and <laughs> more flowery language than that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I found that quite dispiriting, but I didn't do it for very long. It's quite soul destroying, isn't it? You have to be really thick skinned for, for all of that kind of the negativeness that you're going to get from it. Yeah, exactly. And, and as a real part of that, you know, part of the thing I've learned is I'm always really nice to people who cold call me because I, I've, I've done that job and it's not a lot of fun and they're just doing their job. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's nice. Good. That's a good learning thing to take away from that. Um, okay. Do you, cats or dogs? So it's an important question. Mm, uh, I'm, I'm probably dogs. We've got two of each, but I, I'm definitely a dog person. Okay. All right. And last question. Can you tell me something that is true to you? So you believe that you are completely, you completely agree on, but nobody else agrees with you on. So an un, your unpopular opinion. Hmm. Popular opinion. Um, I've got to be honest. I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll say, uh, I've I've never been a fan of uh, of Star Wars. Wow. Um, I I don't I don't get it really. I like Empire Strikes Back. I think that's a good film, but I, I I've never really bought into Star Wars. That's quite a big one. That's quite controversial as well. I think. Yeah. You know, it, it, my partner is exactly the same. He's never ever watched a single Star Wars film. Like never yeah. even. I don't even know how he's got through life having avoided them. Yeah. There's a lot in them in the. Um, I like the, uh, there's a film, I'm, I'm pretty um, obsessed with trees, which we might talk about later, but um, there's one of those films that takes place in the Redwood Forest in California, which I love. I think, I think it's Empire Strike Back. It might be Return of the Jedi. That's and the I think there's a much more... Yeah. But I, I, never, I never got Star Wars. Okay. All right. I feel like you're going to get some comeback to that, Charlie, when this airs. <laughs> Well, thank you for answering those questions. <laughs> thank you for answering those questions. Um, so, I mean, for people that don't know, uh, Charlie is the managing director of Blue Loop, which is the world's leading online resource for professionals working in the visitor attraction sector. And I have to just start by saying that throughout the last three or four months, Blue Loop has been absolutely invaluable to anybody working in in the profession and in and in this sector. It has been an absolute fountain of knowledge about what's happening in the UK, what's happening globally. Just you know, it it has been the one place that I've turned to on a daily basis actually to see what is going on and how people are coping. So, firstly, thank you for all of the hard work that's gone into that. I'd really love to hear a little bit about what your background is and how you ended up as managing director of Blue Loop. Yeah, sure. I, I um, Going way back, I, my, my degree was um, from a poly. I don't exist anymore. I think they're all universities. Um, I did law, so I was a lawyer for a while. Then I sort of drifted into publishing. And by the time we came down to Devon, where I live now, um, we live in the middle of nowhere, I, I needed a job I could do from home. And um, I'd always been 
really, really keen on, you know, zoos, aquariums, attractions. And so I, um, and I knew the publishing world, which I'd worked in, was uh, gradually moving online. So uh, that's when I came, um, I came up with the idea. And I very purposely decided to make it about attractions as a whole, rather than just museums or just theme parks, uh, because right then I recognised the, um, this is a dreadful, awful management speak word, but the commonalities between all these kind of attractions. I, I, I saw that there were a few sort of sites that were just about specific sectors and companies that, that marketed themselves as just being about working in a specific vertical market. But to be frank, most design companies, for example, they don't really care if the call comes in from an aquarium or a zoo or a museum. And, uh, and also museums specifically more and more have been coming much more interactive, much more immersive. They're, they're understanding, um, even if they're not for prof profit, they're commercial organizations that need to drive people through the gates. They need to get people to stay there, need to help them have memorable experiences. So all visitor attractions are about creating experiences. So I thought it would work to have a site that covered all kinds of experiences and attractions. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that there's, you, you kind of see museums in a slightly different segment quite a lot of the time. And I've never really understood that because they do have the same challenges as a, as a, as a theme park, for example, in terms of getting those customers through the door and, the, and that experience part of the process. So it's good that you've, yeah, I completely agree with you on that. How has it developed over the years? So um, it was just, was it just yourself when you started it? And then how has it grown? Yeah, it was just me. I started it on my own. Um, my wife, who runs a business with me, Rachel, she was an accountant for a long time. She was earning very well. And so it took me a good few years until we got our revenue up enough that she could leave that job and work with Blue Loop. And since then, it's progressed and grown very well every year since then. Um, and yeah, we've just gradually built up what we offer, developed the website, made it better. Um, and yeah, just really, really worked hard to provide a, a good service to our readers and, and to our clients. So how has lockdown been for you? Because I guess you're quite used to working from home. So that, that obviously hasn't been a huge change. But how has it been for you personally and, and, and also as an organisation? You know, what kind of things have you been doing to support your, your audience through all of this? Yeah, we, we, I think first, personally, in terms of my experience, um, I do work from home, so the day-to-day -day life is much the same. Um, we live in quite a rural area, so um, it's been okay to go outside and walk around and go running or whatever, so that's all fine. Um, and so the main change to me personally is not travelling. So I, I, used, I normally go to London probably once a week. Um, I, I tend to fly somewhere once a month, I would say. So not travelling anywhere. Um, it's been a change, but it's not been a bad change. I've quite enjoyed being at home and, you know, focusing on the garden and walking with dogs and stuff like that. Um, as a business, we, we decided early on that we wanted to maintain and continue to give as good a service as we could. We thought it was important to provide as much useful coverage as we, we could about uh, coronavirus and its impact. Um, unfortunately, there's been some great, um, you know, resources online, in, including uh, you, Kelly, and, and the, you know, the... The, um, the, the work you've done putting together sources, uh, IAPA, for example, as well, um, American um, Alliance of American Museums. There's, there's a lot of great resources out there, and we thought that we were one of them in terms of um, just putting information out there and reporting what's happening. So we decided to do that. Um, yeah, and business has been fine, to be honest. It's been impacted a little bit, but our traffic has continued to grow, which has been great. And so I think we're in a, a good position to sort of you know, continue through to the new normal, whatever that will be. Yeah, who knows? There's a long way to go, isn't there? We'll, we'll ask you about that in a, in a little while. But and, and what kind of things have you been doing to support your audience? I mean, you've been you've been so constant, um, like a constant source of 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 resource and a constant source of knowledge throughout it. Um, you obviously have a huge membership database of attractions. How have you been able to kind of help them whilst this has been going on? Well, we've actually, a lot of what we do is not really, I guess you wouldn't see. So we speak to a lot of people on the phone, on calls, and where they seek advice, we put people in touch with other people. So we do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but it's more really in terms of the business, creating content, um, chasing up um, people for news, checking news, this kind of stuff, just making sure that what we report is correct, which is always important. Um, 
Yeah, so, and just making sure we give a good service to our readers, because we, 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 I'm very aware that there's an awful lot of people out there who are either furloughed, have lost their jobs, there's whole attractions that are closing. And I think from our point of view, if we, at least if we can carry on giving as good a service as we've been doing, then that, that's important to us. Yeah, that's good. And I guess, you know, you want people to continue to use you. So you've been super supportive throughout all of this. I think, you know, any membership organization that I've spoken to um, has been doing the same. They just really care about their, they care about their members. They care about the people that they, um, is their, as their audience. And they've wanted to do as much as they possibly can to help them throughout all of this. I mean, it, that's certainly the approach that we've been taking with our clients as well, you know, from a, from a different perspective, we've seen people that we work with and talk to on a daily basis just not there anymore you know we're they've been furloughed we there's nothing that they can do to help the organization that that is closed and it's been a really it's been really tough um lots of positives this week though and as we speak um it's it's mid it's coming up to mid july attractions are open if they are able to open safely which is is wonderful to see we are seeing um, a number of our clients opening uh, next week uh, which is great. So we're doing lots of work to support them. I mean, how how is the kind of general mood in the industry at the moment? You're probably best placed to answer that question because you speak to so many different people. Yeah, I think it's um, it's obviously bizarre and unique time. So I think that's the first thing to say. And also, people don't really know. So it's the uncertainty. I think is the is the worst thing. Um, obviously a lot of attractions are facing you know pretty catastrophic times immediately right now so there's the misery of people losing their jobs um, people being furloughed who won't get taken back on there's all that kind of stuff um, I, I think there's there's a kind of cautious optimism from a lot of people I speak to about you know we're a resilient industry as a whole uh, we'll adapt you know theme parks attractions museums they'll just have to changes the way they operate they'll have to invest in new technologies so i think um there's a kind of cautious optimism it, it is a resilient industry people do want to go out and do things like people are bursting at the seams to go out and visit attractions it, it may not be right now it may take a few months until you know coronavirus sort of drifts away a little bit more but i i, I as i say I'm, I'm generally quite an optimistic person and I, I think we're also seeing a lot of companies sort of pivoting in terms of what they do People are adapting the businesses. There are some kinds of businesses that will do well out of this, perhaps tech companies, app companies, for example. Um, you know, companies are, are doing things, really obvious things, like you know, making masks or, or sanitizing equipment, that kind of stuff. So I think it's a time of innovation and change. And I think although we can acknowledge it's dreadful in many, many ways, um, I think the industry will survive as a whole, but just come out you know, differently. It's good that you mentioned that because one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is um, if there's anything that attractions can kind of learn from the COVID-19 situation, if, if there's anything positive that has, that can come out of this situation. I think um, in, one thing it's going to do is accelerate, I think it's going to accelerate changes uh, in terms of a move to digital, for example. That's something that is happening. It was happening and it's going to happen much more quickly than it was. So things like face recognition for example touchless technology this kind of stuff was happening but that will be accelerated so that's one thing i think um a lot of attractions can perhaps rethink how they operate so um you know in the states for example right now there's a boom in agritourism so people are visiting farms in their near to where they live because they're becoming places that you can go for an afternoon you can go i don't know working in um in, in the fields, for example. So I think organizations like, let's say the National Trust, organizations, theme parks with lots of land, perhaps can start leveraging their outdoor spaces more than they are now. So I think there's ways that we can be, um, you know, we, we can innovate in terms of what we do with visitors when they get through the doors. And I think that kind of change will happen as well. Yeah, that's interesting. We're, we're actually speaking to, um... Alastair Barber from the National Parks uh, in a couple of days and that's one of the things that I want to speak to him about is obviously at the moment outdoor attractions are seemed and deemed to be a lot safer than indoor attractions so there has been a huge increase in demand I mean we've seen um, ticket sales for uh, Chester Zoo, uh, Whipsnade, Wildlife Park you know 
the, the ticket sales have gone through the roof and obviously they're at capped capacity at the moment, but the demand is, is absolutely there. And it will be really interesting to see how that translates into the demand for some of the indoor attractions as well. Um, and if there are things, if they have outdoor space, will they start to use them more? Will they start to kind of see that as, as, a, as an advantage? Um, do you think, you know, you talked a little bit about overseas there. I wanted to see, see if there's anything that you think that the UK attractions can learn from overseas attractions. Is there anything that you've seen that they're doing differently that we can implement here? Well, I think the, the most obvious thing is to look at, um, in terms of operations, is to look at what attractions are doing um, in places where they've essentially conquered to a large degree the coronavirus. So if you look at, um, you know, China, Singapore, these kind of places, when they're operating, but where attractions have been open for weeks, how they're doing it, look at the day-to-day -day operations like Shanghai Disney, for example, um, look at how they treat visitors, look at how streamlined the process is, this kind of stuff. So that's what they can learn from in an obvious way. Um, also, there's been, a, there's been a, a big move from attractions to becoming, um, I think, more engaging on social media. Um, so reaching out to audiences, even if the audiences aren't there. So, so that kind of reaching out will continue even when the visitor's coming back. So that will, again, will have accelerated that kind of move. So that there's tons of initiatives, um, you know, online in terms of gaming and gamification and um, engagement with, with audiences that are really inspiring. Like, um, I know the Animal Crossing work, you know, with uh, the Field Museum and even something really obvious like the, you know, the penguins from the Shed Aquarium wandering, wandering around the Field Museum. Oh, it's a good example of, uh, of two institutions collaborating and doing something really engaging um, and kind of thinking out the, outside of the box. That was lovely, wasn't it? I think that, yeah, for me, um, sort of at the beginning of lockdown, there was a real um, surge of some really kind of creative and innovative content being pushed out by a lot of organisations. And it was just so... It was just lovely, and it was—it's like you say, it's—it's it's about being part of the conversation, even if you're—you can't be open to your guests. It's still sharing that experience of what your what your attraction is like. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw the the National Cowboy Museum. And, oh um, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. my gosh, Tim! It wasn't he just just it was just lovely. What what an absolute star. So Cowboy Tim, for any of you that haven't seen this, please go and check it out. Go and, go and look at the National Cowboy Museum because their Twitter content was just so fabulous at the start of lockdown. Um, Cowboy Tim is their, their security guard, isn't he? He's their security manager. Yeah. So he was inside the museum and he was, he was just kind of talking you around some of the things that were there and showing you what he was doing on a daily basis. And, you know, it was just heartwarming, wasn't it? That it's not his role. He's no social media yeah. manager, but it just, it was so kind of authentic. Um, and I'm sure it's gained them a huge amount of extra followers. Um, oh yeah. And it was, it was fantastic for exactly the reason you say it, it was real. He, he wasn't someone who'd been schooled in social media, very obviously, but he was just genuine and um, you know, he was articulate and genuine and it was just funny and it was everything that social media should be really yeah yeah it's really lovely to see and i do hope that that's done wonders for them um it's funny i mean i i don't know when i'll get over there but that's definitely a place that i'm going to go and check out as soon as i can <laughs> oh yeah and see tim <laughs> absolutely um so tell us a little bit about kind of what what's next for blue loop now because um we know that you run a conference every year that is I'm guessing going to change quite a lot this year. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've got planned? Yeah, sure. We, well, we've been, we've been running uh, Blue Loop Live in London for the last uh, four or five years. And um, we started thinking actually more, uh, probably around a year ago about moving online, long before COVID. So um, we, COVID has been dreadful for, for a billion reasons and the most trivial of, trivial of them all is that it made me feel quite opportunistic when we announced we were doing a virtual conference when COVID started, but because we had been planning it for many, many months. Um, so yeah, we're doing our conference in October. It's, it's called the, uh, the V Expo, Virtual Expo. And it's essentially a, a version of our London conference, but bumped up. So it's, um, it's, very, it's relying on great content. We've got fantastic speakers from around the world. Um, we've got speakers from across a whole variety of attractions from 
you know, major theme parks to top museums to new live experiences where we've got speakers announcing expansions to major institutions. We've got speakers launching um, new live experiences, um, revealing new plans for new resorts. So we've got a ton of people announcing new things at, at the conference. Um, we've also got uh, an exhibition on, so um, vendor companies can, um, can have booths and they can showcase their products and services. They can interact with people who, who visit. And so we see it as an opportunity of basically expanding our London conference, make, making it available to a global audience. And also with, um, you know, it's online, we can get speakers from California or from India without them having to fly over here. Uh, so it's, much, it's just much easier for uh, attendees and for um for the speakers we've, we've also made it um it's free to register but we're absolutely aware that you know th this year of all years there's tons and tons of people who uh, either have been furloughed or lost their jobs or uh, uncertain about their future so you know we've made it free to attend i think that's an important point um and we're also working closely with our friends at merlin they're supporting us in terms of you know promotion in terms of uh, providing the backdrops for the exhibition as well and, uh, and yeah, that'll take place in, in October. So we're doing that. Um, few, a few things that will happen during that we're working on now. We're, we're just about to launch the next few days our um, Blue Loop 50, which is the theme park influences of the year. And we're also launching a Blue Loop 50 museum influences as well. So the results of both of those will be announced during the virtual expo as well. Uh, and we're also gonna do a virtual run during the expo. So um, I'm hoping you, Kelly, will be doing at least five miles. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'll, I feel like I'll, 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 I'll take that as red. We'll Gauntlet's it. just been thrown down there, hasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we're doing that. So yeah, I think there's a, there's a whole lot of things we'll do to make it really interesting and really engaging. And it really won't be, um, it won't be just a series of Zoom calls. It'll be very, very different to that. So absolutely looking, you know, I'm looking forward to doing it. That sounds so positive. I think like it's lovely that you've been able to make that free for people. I think what an incredible gesture at a time where things are still going to be very difficult. I and mean, we have to be, you know, cautious, cautiously excited that attractions can open and, and, and are open now. But we, it, this is the start of quite a long phase of, of challenge for people. So to be able to offer that for free is wonderful. And I think it's such a positive that you can take something that was so London centric and now it, it's a global a global conference and anyone from all over the world can can come and access it um so easily good great well, we'll be there you know that for sure yeah, um i love to end the podcast interviews by asking you um about a book that you'd recommend that's kind of helped shape your career or has stood out to you in in any way throughout it do you have one that you could suggest for us yeah it's an interesting question because i was I imagine I don't, I don't read business and leadership books very. I, I tend to read fiction. I've I've never been a fan of um, business books. Um, but I'd say first of all, two books that really influenced me were when I was a kid. I read My Family and Other Animals, which got me interested in wildlife, and um, I have been ever since. I've I've got tanks of praying mantids downstairs. I've been keeping praying mantids since wow. I was about seven. So I've got mantids downstairs. Um, um, I'm pretty obsessed with trees. I grow trees. So that, that kind of, that book really shaped a lot of my outlook for my whole life, really. Um, I also read Out of Africa when I was uh, in my teens, which again is about um, East Africa. And perhaps it's about an East Africa that once was and doesn't exist anymore. So it's a very beautiful book. So that's a great book. Uh, in terms of business, um, I, I prefer a story. I, the Enron story is fantastic. There's a, a wonderful book called Smartest Guys in the Room about the... Um, the guys behind Enron and how that um, story unfolded. That, that's a remarkable book. Um, and I think in, what, what, in terms of writing, what one, um, one author I love is uh, the American crime writer, Elmore Leonard. And he has a, a fantastic um, essay he did. I think, I think it's 10 rules of writing. And anyone who's writing anything, it's worth reading. It's absolutely brilliant. And I think the first one is, is never start with the weather, which I think is a great, that is a yes. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. <laughs> exactly, and it, it has, it's tons of just really great tips from a, a brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, like one of them again is never use a, a euphemism for said. So you you would never write um, you know uh, Kelly observed or Kelly observed astutely. 
just Kelly said because it, it just sounds better it's quicker and I think bad writing is, is when you do that I love that you have recommended books that nobody else has spoken about. And I really love that you've recommended books that, have, that are linked to kind of your personal development as well as, you know, aside from your career development as well. I have to say though, that you've completely blown my marketing budget yet again. So I ask everyone to recommend a book. Most people have recommended at least two books. We right. give them away as prizes. So uh, if you're listening to this and you'd like to win a copy of all of Charlie's books that he's recommended, (laughs) then um, if you head over to our Twitter account, skip the queue and retweet this episode announcement with the comment, I want Charlie's books, then you could be in with a chance of winning. I need to ask you about your, your man, prayer mantis. Did you say that you've got downstairs? Yeah. Praying mantis. uh, Gosh. They're they're incredible insects. There's, there's, I think, two and a half thousand species or more around the world. They're all made to the same design, but each species is different. There's, there's mantids camouflaged as dry grass, mantids camouflaged as sticks. Um, the one, ones I've got camouflaged as dead leaves. Okay. There's, there's even mantids camouflaged as orchids that live on orchids leaves, leaves and are pink. So they're extraordinary animals. What and they're it, really, really, really easy to keep. What, how did you... I, I know this is completely, this is not, this is not a, a, a tried to attractions at all, but I need to know yeah. this, Charlie. So how did, how did you first decide this is the pet for me? This is the animal for me? Well, when I was really young, I used to get a magazine called Look and Learn in the UK, which uh, your elder listeners will, will know about. And it had an article about mantids. And I always remember it had a paragraph that said they're really easy to keep. You can simply feed them on pieces of dried vegetables. So my mum said, fine, that's fine. We'll get one of those. So we got one. And then as soon as we got one, we realised that that paragraph had been completely untrue and you have to feed them on live flies. Oh, God. <laughs> so, I bet so, your mum was delighted. Well, exactly, yeah. So, and ever, ever since then, I've just found them fascinating. And, and wherever you go in the world, if you're in a reasonably warm country, there are different species of mantids. So if I'm in Singapore and I'm visiting a trade show, I'll always go off to the national parks and I'll always go you know, of taking photographs and looking for insects. Oh, I love this. So does that mean that you're, that you're kind of, I'm not going to ask you to choose your favourite attraction because that would be, I'm sure, too difficult. But does that mean that you are much more drawn to attractions that, that are, you know, like parks, botanical gardens, um, wildlife parks, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I, um, I, I love theme parks, of course, and I go to theme parks whenever I can. But we've got people who work here who are obsessed with theme parks and go all the time. But I, I wouldn't say I'm like that. But I am pretty much obsessed with, with uh, uh, botanical gardens, um, aquariums, um, and zoos. So, yeah, I, I think the attraction I've been most to in my life is Kew Gardens. Oh. The trees. Yeah, I mean, it's just a beautiful place as well. I hope that they are going to do their Christmas show this year because the Christmas lights is just magical, isn't it? Oh, the Christmas lights are fantastic. Yeah. I'm supposed to be running a marathon there in... Uh, September as well. So you're a marathon runner who's just challenged me to do a five mile. I feel like this could end quite badly for me. Oh, you, you're <laughs> make it 5K, 5K. All right. Thanks, Charles. Charles, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been absolutely delightful to, to talk to you. Um, we will put all of the information in the show notes, um, especially all the information about the Blue Loop Expo, which is coming up. Um, I think it's wonderful that you're doing that for, for just for registration. So thanks so much for everything that you've been doing for the, for the sector throughout this. It's really appreciated. It's a pleasure, Kelly. Thanks for inviting me along. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.